What if you became Genghis Khan's warrior for one day? The Mongol army on the horizon is the herald of terror for any 13th-14th century nation. But everything you know about them from textbooks is probably not entirely accurate. They almost certainly didn't tell you that history even remembers the Yellow Crusade in 1256, when the Mongols, together with the Christians, made a real meat grinder for the Muslims of the East. In fact, some rulers like Hulagu married Christians and, like the Greeks, were seen as liberators, not conquerors. Soon we will introduce you to the history of this amazing nation and rejoice in the fact that the times of its power are long gone and an army more like the post-apocalyptic army from Mad Max will never again appear on the horizon. Neither the Russian Empire nor the USSR were the largest nations on the planet. Such was the British Empire with its colonies from the US to India at its peak power. But there was another state that ranked second in the historical ranking, the Mongol Empire, which took a quarter of the planet's territory and population. What associations arise in your head when you hear this name? At best, something to do with unwashed nomadic barbarians, don't you think? History textbooks do a good job, because they are written by the winners. But now let's think logically, could unwashed and uneducated Mongols capture and hold half the world? After all, we are talking about the 13th century, when castles and heavy weaponry were commonplace. But somehow the Mongols overpowered the Chinese who owned gunpowder on the one hand and the knights hardened by crusades on the other, often possessing an equal number of troops. It's a bit of a mismatch, isn't it? The fact is that Europe, Russia and Asia are not too comfortable to recognize the fact that in the past their state and military systems did not compare in any way with what was the Mongol Empire. So the textbooks make the guys look like barbarians as best they can. But in the next couple minutes, we're going to fix that. Prepare to learn how the Mongols became the parents of modern traffic rules, revolutionized siege work and delivered parcels at a speed that to this day has never been dreamed of by the Russian post. And Mr. Leo Messi will help us in this. Surely the name seems strange to you and it is true. After all, it carries notes of Buddhism, which was already spreading in Mongolia, competing with traditional shamanism. Unlike Rome, the system of names of this empire is more complicated, mainly because it consisted of thousands of different tribes, which were united by an ingenious system of management. More on that from here, though. Our Leo Messi is on his horse standing in front of the Great Wall of China. We are in the year 1213, and the Mongol army clearly proves that in terms of defense, the Chinese wall is not the best defensive structure in history. It's a joke. What's the point of 9,000 kilometers? Not if the Mongols just captured one fortress and drove their 100,000 troops through it. Our Leo is thinking something like that, rubbing his metal helmet. Yeah, yeah, metal. The Mongols are not the way of assholes with bows. The boys had fine heavy cavalry. Mr. Messi is armed with a long sword, shrouded in iron laminar armor, and carries a huge square shield to protect him from arrows when storming a fortress. The history textbooks are tactfully silent about this. Don't they? They also omit the fact that the Mongols had nukers. 
That's what they called typical soldiers of the empire. Funny thing is, of all the armies in our videos, the Mongol army is the easiest to understand. 10 Nukers Like our Leo, make a dozen. 100 are hundreds. Thousands. 10,000 and so on, decimalized. The largest army could have 100,000 nukers. But the twist is different. All the members of the 10 are RA, relatives. And the members of the hundred that holds the fortress on the Great Wall of China are distant relatives or guys from a neighboring village. Genghis Khan, the ruler of the empire, acted cunningly, as did the Roman generals. He made up army cells from people close to him. They were literally willing to die for each other. And at the level of hundreds, many competitions began. After all, a hundred relatives of our Messi really wanted to prove to hundreds of guys from the neighboring village that they would capture their part of the castle faster. Isn't that right? And after a joint battle, the neighbors forgot their former enmity and became friends. It's little cubes like this that make up an empire. In 1206, considered the beginning of the great Mongolian state, Mr. Temuchin took the name of Genghis Khan and issued a code of laws called Yasa Genghis Khan. Therein lay the division into tens and hundreds. And at the same time in a kind of constitution was prescribed the duty of mutual assistance and trust. Cowardice and betrayal were suppressed at the state level. And it was also about enemies, those who stood for their own to the last were respected. Often they were directly offered to join the empire. But cowards willing to betray their homeland in Mongolia were not welcome. A couple of important points were regulated at the highest level. One of them was, to a familiar motorist, whoever is behind is to blame. Let's say our Leo Messi is driving behind a comrade and notices his coin purse falling. Leo is obliged to pick it up and return it, as he is riding behind and has to watch his friend's back. Even the death penalty was threatened for breaking this rule. Therefore, in battle, Mongols were literally responsible for the comrade in front. And you know why there were still some happy people? Because by the fall of 1213, China had all but fallen. And that meant that he and his hundreds of acquaintances would lose a tidbit of land, along with peasants and space for nomadism. A Noyan, similar to European princes, would be in charge. He will be required to establish village life and build a male career station. Genghis Khan in the very name of the constitution prescribed that every village should have a post office. They had horses, substitutes, and water, and total defense. Such a post office had already been fixed at the Chinese wall. That's why, in a short time, the Mongols captured all of northern China. Genghis Khan's orders reached thousands and hundreds, but very quickly. And they in turn were obliged to allocate all the warriors to the battle at the first order. No one was against it. The booty, not that it was distributed fairly, but there was so much of it that there was enough for everyone. As you can understand, the Mongols had no problems with logistics and state system. 
There were even rudiments of democracy, and villagers often gathered to discuss local problems. But the main engine of conquest was still people. For the Mongols, warriors from birth, our Messi does not remember life without training. At the age of three, his mother strapped him to a saddle and rode him around the yard for hours. At the age of five, Leo already had his own bow, to shoot from which he devoted several hours a day. At ten, he was already attending hunts and felt better in the saddle than your butt in a chair. The Mongols used stunted, hairy horses, which was a killer combination. On the one hand, such a horse is not afraid of cold weather and can pinch grass right on the go, and on the other hand, our trained Leo at that moment calmly sits right in the saddle. This is another bonus in the piggy bank of the speed of movement of Mongolian armies, which was incredible. Where did the backward barbarians get the industry to forge armor and build guns? The secret is simple. No backward barbarians Mongols were not. They had a beautiful alphabet based on the system of Uyghur symbols, which is still used in Mongolia. When storming the Chinese wall, Leo Messi and his comrades used Tangut siege towers, light catapults and the famous Greek fire. And after the conquest of China, they went all out. Genghis Khan was a savvy guy, and all the creations of Chinese engineers benefited the horde. By the time of their campaigns to the west, the Mongols were already using handheld gunpowder shells, Chinese siege catapults and even heavy crossbows. One such was manned by hundreds of men and did terrible damage to the defending side. Trainability was a major strength of the Mongol Empire. When someone saw a promising technology, the guys immediately learned how to use it. The same can be said about battle tactics, which were first borrowed from the same Chinese. Genghis Khan actively used reconnaissance, spies, and never threw opponents, meat, as it likes to draw modern movies. On the contrary, the Mongols studied the enemy by launching surprise strikes, ambushes, and making maximum efforts to intimidate the enemy. After conquering China, the Mongols turned their gaze westward. You know how that ended, conquering the entire Middle East, along with the assassins and other small states. Genghis Khan was already dead at that point, but our Leo Messi could still snag the time of the complete defeat of the Crusaders in 1241. The Mongol army had effectively wiped out the chivalry of Europe in battles in Poland and Hungary. Byzantium was only bought off with huge sums of money, half of Russia was burning and the other half was paying tribute. The Mongols evolved once again, adopting the most powerful Persian trebuchets from conquered countries. The guy's battle tactics combined with the sheer size of the army left no chance for anyone. On the other hand, logistics and mail worked perfectly, and the nomadic lifestyle quietly fed the warriors. If necessary, our Messi could slightly open a horse's vein to drink some of its blood and move on. But what went wrong? The answer is simple. Ordinary human greed, pride and avarice. Genghis Khan always personally appointed commanders of large units and kept his hand on the pulse of the state. After his death, the mess began. Khan's will appointed his son as his successor. In 1206 he was elected, but the younger son, Tului, was more popular in the army. It was the conflicts for power between the heirs of Genghis Khan, not that they resulted in conflicts, but hindered the development of the horde. 
For example, one of the Mongol commanders, Jubba, despite the death of Monk Khan and the retreat of his native army to Iran, still led part of the army to battle with the Egyptians. Unprepared and unsupported, the Mongols lost miserably, making their enemies feel their power. Inconsistency in management, including, led to the fact that after the destruction of the military power of chivalry, the Mongols never returned to Europe. The very Khan Batu from domestic history textbooks simply in a puff of dust broke the European armies and returned to his homeland, because Khan Yugade died and had to run to negotiate for lands and resolve internecine conflicts. And even despite all this, the empire continued to flourish. Perhaps the most powerful heir of Genghis Khan was his grandson White. It was he who founded the Chinese Yuan dynasty, which is considered an official part of the history of the Celestial Empire even to this day. True, only after the heaviest civil war inside Mongolia, which lasted four years. Under Genghis Khan, this did not happen. By that time the state was a complete chaos. Kubilai's mother was a Christian. And on the vast territory of the Khanate it was possible to meet representatives of any religious denominations in addition to progressive thinking. Kubilai divided China into 12 federations for easy management, promoted the ideas of Buddhism and was a very educated man. Herein lies one of the main mistakes of history textbooks. For the heir to the Mongol Empire is not modern Mongolia, but China. You don't believe me? Look in a Chinese history book. Do you know who is listed there under the dynastic name of the founder of the dynasty? Kublai Khan. So the question of whether you should love or hate the business that Leo Messi was engaged in is a complicated one. On the one hand, history is known for the Mongols slaughtering entire cities, but on the other hand, they showed the world what could be done with providing an army with training, logistics and science. In addition, many scholars are inclined to believe that if it were not for the Mongol Empire, similar campaigns to the West would have been made by China. And there is also a theory that not internecine strife destroyed the horde, and recently historians believe that it was destroyed by the plague, which thanks to the luxurious trade routes traveled through the empire as at home. But this is another story. In the meantime, it is worth remembering that the Mongols were not such devils as they are described as. Again, we are talking about an era when people with hundreds of thousands killed each other for religious reasons. And witches were burned at the stake. So, whatever the Mongols were, they were a weighty part of the history of the planet, and you can't forget such things. See you again, friends. Thanks for watching.